I would say GnRH analogs are one of the most used and abused pediatric endocrinology medicines. What we'll try to do is to go through the various uh, clinical aspects of this today. We'll try to see what is the indications which are there, which are established, where it is controversial and where it should not be used. So it's not only evidence because everything is not evidence-based and you may not have evidence for many things. But when you deal with a new case, you always have to answer the question whether it is need to do or not. We'll discuss about that. Now, we all know all about this. So I'll just go through quickly. We all know that the GnRH is the major regulator of overall hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. It is controlled via the suppressive and the stimulatory factors. We discussed a lot about GABA and MRKN3 and glutamate and kispeptin, but it's ultimately the GnRH neuron, which are pulsatile, but at a very low rate before puberty and suddenly start to pulsate more at night and then at daytime. Once that happens, they start triggering the production of LH, which acts on the theca cell to produce androstenedione, and which also go all towards the FSH, which acts on the granulosa cell to stimulate aromatase production to produce estradiol. So ultimately, we are looking about this estradiol, which is the major mediator of all the factors which are there, which will include, of course, the breast development, the menstrual cycle, and most importantly, the growth plate. So what does estrogen do to the growth plate? So it increases at multiple stages. It increases also the development of new chondrocytes. So when you talk about resting to the proliferative, they will increase, but it also increases the apoptosis. So it is not only causing more growth, it is also causing more greater increase in bone age. So in a way, while it is causing people to grow tall, ultimately it will result in landing short. So estrogen therefore is an important thing to remember from that perspective in that regard. So that's very, very important. And that's what we're looking at. We are looking at how to mitigate the effect of estrogen on the uterus, because that is one concern. Second is about the growth plate. This is the only two things we are talking about in that perspective. Now, of course, the adrenals produce DHEAs, which is independent. Now, is adrenarchy an earlier event or is gonadarchy an earlier event, Manoj? Generally, it is parallel. In boys, usually adrenarchy is much earlier. And that is why we said there is adrenarchy and then you have gonadarchy. That's why gynecomastia is there because of that disconnect. In girls, it may be plus minus six months. So it is pretty close, but they are distinct events. And therefore, the relevance, which I'm why we are talking about adrenarchy here, is that if you're giving GnRH analog, it is not going to do any change in pubic hair because that is the independent mechanism. So if your bone age goes above a particular level, GnRH analog is not going to work in that perspective. Now, what we need to understand from this perspective is that you need to have a pulsatile secretion of GnRH to cause gonadotrophin stimulation to cause pubertal status. If you have a continuous exposure, then you can basically have a suppression. So why are we using a GnRH agonist and not an antagonist Pratik? So yeah, that's fine. So why don't we use antagonist directly rather than using other way around? So why are we holding the ear like this and not straight? So they antagonists are short acting. Where do we use antagonists? In which treatment? They're very commonly used in the treatment of IVF, infertility in those protocols. So they are part of those protocols where you block immediately. So they are short acting. And now oral GnRH antagonists are also being developed. So we have to watch the space whether they could be something good in terms of that. But otherwise, they are very, very short acting. And they do not, therefore, are not used at all in the treatment of precocious puberty. Now, when would you think, in what situation would you like to give GnRH antagonist in precocious puberty? So when you start the treatment, what happens with GnRH analog? So in that case, there may be a theoretical role of actually giving an antagonist. So while you know that the flare is there, you can give an antagonist and we'll talk about that. What are the problems of that flare? Uh, Sir, there will have breeding, so withdrawal breeding in either, and there will be an increase in growth velocity. So there could be a theoretical withdrawal breeding. So how can you prevent that withdrawal breeding? By giving a GnRH antagonist, which nobody does, or by giving what? What else can provide avoid menarche? Pratik? 
So you can give progesterone. So some centers do give progesterone as part of routine treatment. So when you're giving GNIH analog, they say, I give progesterone. We do not. And we'll discuss about that because there is no clear cut evidence for that. And even when you stop progesterone, sometimes you will have a withdrawal bleeding. So that problem may be there. So now in the whole axis, if I ask you, even if you know nothing about this, what are the ways you can block if a girl comes to you with precocious puberty and I say I'm concerned about two things, uterus and bones, what are the pharmacological agents which you can use from head to toe, which can help you out on that? So you can think about this axis and tell me what can be done right from the beginning. Uh, you can block the inhibitors. So that is even before that, anything can be done? You can inhibit that. Inhibit which one? Yeah, so GABA, of course, is a local neurotransmitter. You can't give GABA. You have to inject it in the brain. Anything else out of these four, what, what can be done? You can uh, give Yes, so Kispeptin is basically an agent which stimulates the onset of puberty. So if you give theoretically a Kispeptin antagonist, that can work. And there is some trial. And we'll talk about all that later on. So you can give Kispeptin antagonist. As discussed, you can give GNRH analogs or antagonist, but analogs are better. Then later, Nietzsche, estrogen receptor, estrogen receptor modulators. Modulator. Yes, why don't we use ER modulators, Pratik? Rather than GNRH analog, use the ER modulators? Sir, it will not help in the other aspect. Like? Uh... So it will be like giving calcium and calcitriol for hypoparathyroidism. Giving TTH is difficult. So it is like a jugad. So you're trying to do something in the end, you're giving that. But then, one, it will not be completely suppressing it. Second, what will happen to the ovaries? If you actually block the estrogen using aromatase inhibitors. Now, one, aromatase inhibitors, why won't you use it? In girls, why won't you use aromatase inhibitors, Naveen? Yes, because your estrogen will come down, but androgens will go up. So aromatase inhibitors are out. It may be used in boys, but not here. Sit down. So we'll go one by one. Kiss peptin antagonist, a theoretical possibility. We'll discuss about that. GNRH analog, of course, we are using it. GNRH antagonist, theoretical possibility. Now let's go. Then you talk about LH blockers, FSH blockers. There are nothing much, not much agents there. So aromatase inhibitors. Now aromatase inhibitors out in girls because there is a risk of hyperandrogenism, which is there. The only role theoretically could be in females who have macune albite syndrome. That's a peripheral precocity. People use it. SAMS, selective estrogen receptor modulator or estrogen receptor antagonist. There is a very specific estrogen receptor antagonist, which is fulvi strand, which is used in the treatment of macune albite syndrome. But again, you are not treating the cause. Like GHD, if you give them IGF-1, they may respond, but they will not do as well as if you give them growth hormone. So the main problem is that your gonadotrophins are high, so correct that. So that is why we use GNRH analog, but these are all theoretical possibilities. So from Kispeptin antagonist, GNRH agonist antagonists, uh, aromatase inhibitors anyway out in girls, ER modulators, ER antagonists, these are something which you can use. So this is more like a how to conce conceptualize and what could be the future of treatment in that regards. Now we all know that when we talk about hormonal progression, FSH is always high and then LH takes over. This happens every time. This happens in the fetus. This happens in the mini puberty. This happens in puberty and this happens in each menstrual cycle. FSH is the predominant female gonadotrophin, which is then taken over by the LH. So FSH will start rise first and then LH will lies. And this, of course, has a diagnostic and therapeutic implication. So if your LH is high, you have entered puberty, don't bother about FSH. FSH has no role in terms of pubertal onset. On the other hand, if your FSH is very high, it means there is a problem in your inhibin production or estrogen production, which means there is an ovarian failure. So if you see LH is going up, now what level of LH? A lot of people have debate about that, but very simple. Most of us are using assays, the reports we get are using which technique, Naveen? Which, which technique? Well, uh, like when you talk about techniques, yeah. No, no, no. Like there are two basic techniques. One is structural and one is immunological. So is it structural or immunological? 
it's the immunoassay. Now, immunoassay is earlier there were radio immunoassays and there is chemiluminescence assay. Which one are we using? So most of the reports you get is chemiluminescence based assays. Chemiluminescence based assays are more sensitive as compared to the assays which are used by radio immunoassay. What do you mean by sensitivity here? So not uh, making out. What about analytical sensitivity? We're not talking about clinical sensitivity. So clinical sensitivity is that you're not yeah, missing. Really low, really yes. So sensitivity is the lowest point of detection. So when you are using a immunoassay, uh, the older ones, maybe LH 0.5 is your limit. You can't go below that. With the newer assay, it became 0.1, then 0 0.01 also. So most reports we are seeing is less than 0 0.01. So now you can really go deep. So this sensitivity means how low you can go. So when you say ultra sensitive, it would mean that you can go even lower than that. So if you are using a chemiluminescence assay and your LH is more than 0.2, it basically means that you have entered puberty. LH less than 0.1, unlikely, in between doubtful, then you do a GenRH test. So I would say if you really look at our patients, you would hardly require a GenRH stimulation test. In most cases, you will not require it. Now, many people are obsessed about central and peripheral precocious puberty. Peripheral precocious puberty is extremely rare. It will have disjuncted pattern of puberty. You will have ovarian cysts, which are there. Estrogen will be hugely high and LH will be undetectable. So it's theoretical. If your estrogen is very high, you will have less amount of estrogen, LH and less amount of, what will happen to FSH? Prati? Well, Inhibition is not there at all. So FSH will also be low if your A is very high. So theoretically, and you need to remember that the inhibitory signals are more important than the feedback mechanism at this age group. So if you're talking about precocious puberty, which is peripheral, I have not seen it more than 0.1. So it's always zero. If you have thyrotoxicosis, your, you say TSH should be less than 0 0.01 if the T4 is high. The same applies here. If it is peripheral precocious puberty, LH is less than 0 0.1. So don't get into this trap of the DNRH test become very, very important. It has a role in some cases, but not most cases. Your pretest probability of having a central precocious puberty is 90% anyways. So you are more likely to be central than peripheral. So don't get that confused. If LH is more than 0 0.2, forget it. It's basically central precocious puberty. And you will talk about the guidelines also. So if basal is more than 0.2, it's fine. LH 0 0.2 is more than enough. After GNRH, if you really uh, want to know, it should be more than 5. But if it is peripheral, it should not even go above 1. So 5, if it's 3, 4, it can still be central. Or you have not entered puberty. That will be the other thing to look at. Now, we also know that as time progresses, the uterine size increases. And uh, by the time you reach around breast stage four, the uterus becomes big. And if somebody is having a vaginal discharge, which means that in the next six months or so, periods will happen. So these are the things you have to look into in terms of evaluation. What endometrial thickness would you be concerned that the periods might happen quickly? Um, Manu. Yeah, five is very, very imminent. More than three, three and a half, you start worrying that period may happen. Five is like, if you give progesterone, there will be a withdrawal, which happens. So this uterus will also you have to be looking at in that perspective. So precocious puberty in girls, we all know is pubarchy or thilarchy happening before eight years of age and menarchy before nine and a half years of age. So this is something which we all know. And approach is that you have to confirm precocity and very importantly, look at bone age, that bone age is advanced, vaginal mucosa is pale, endometrial thickness is more than 3 mm. Yes, then you look at what is the extent. So if it is pubarchy, maybe it's just a physiological variant. Look at DHEAS and workup. Isolated vaginal bleeding, it is not precocious puberty, go for local causes. If it is a complete precocity, or a isolated thilarchy. Look at bone age. If the bone age is retarded, it is hypothyroidism or no, it won't be retarded. Yes, so if you have GH or thyroid deficiency, so it's GHD or thyroid deficiency. If bone age is normal, it is slowly progressive. If bone age is advanced, it is progressive. You look at LH. 99% cases, it will be more than 0.2, which will basically give you an idea that this is central. Otherwise, uh, it will be peripheral. If it is less than 
six or five years of age get an MRI head in that situation. So this is the basic workup, which we all know very clearly. Now we have a seven-year-old girl with thylarchy. Height is 118 centimeters. Bone age is 6.5 years. LH is 0.1. FSH is 2.2. Estradiol is low. What do you think here? So very importantly, bone age is low. So it is unlikely. Height is not advanced. So unnecessarily don't jump. This turned out to be lipomastia. No workup, no management required in that situation. Two-year-old girl with vaginal bleeding. Thilarki three months ago. Height 92, weight 14 kgs. Breast stage three. What do you think? It is definitely advanced. So bone age was really advanced. Now you look at the next report. LHFSH undetectable and estrogen very high. So this is peripheral. If you have such a young child with a general bleeding, only two things, Macune versus hematoma. So hematoma will be very high LH. This is zero LH. So this is clearly Macune Albert syndrome. What is the role of GNRH analog here, Manoj? Would you give GNRH analog? So nothing, no role. So the only role would be if you have a secondary triggered puberty. So there's no role out here in terms of GNRH analog here. And there was a macune albert syndrome. Now, coming on to what we are going to discuss today, the management. So of course, as discussed, if the age is less than six years of age and six to eight years with an advanced bone age. Now, how do you look at advanced bone age? I would say the best parameter is height standard deviation score for bone age. If you go to our app, you will get that height SDS for bone age. You enter the height and the bone age. And if it is less than minus two, that means that the child is definitely short. If you have that, treatment should be given. These are the standard recommendations which are there. We'll discuss about other cases as to what options can be there. Now, GNRH analog, of course, will cause uh, a continuous exposure causing suppression. There will be a flare effect in the beginning. And ultimately, you will have desensitization. So LHFSH will be low. Now, how low do you want these LHFSH to go, Pratik? But what will be your idea? So yeah, so it's a debate as to what is the pre level. So people have seen that if you do a random gonadotropin level, that level may be detectable, but still the puberty is very well suppressed. So people have said one, no role of a random gonadotropin level. Second, people started doing, okay, let's do a GNRH test. So formal GNRH test. You give GNRH in C, less than five. Again, it was like a too much of a work every time you do. Third, people said that whatever GNRH analog we are giving, also contains some short acting. There is some part of it. So if you're giving uh, maybe 11.25 uh, milligrams, there will be some which is there as the a free form, which will be released immediately, and that will act like a GNRH analog. And then people started saying the level should be less than four, some say less than two. So there are various recommendations there, but as you will discuss about in terms of the committee, the role is clinical monitoring is the main. Don't go just by the LH levels. I've seen people who do every time they do LHFSH and then they keep on increasing the dose because there is no clear cut evidence that once you go below this, you're going to benefit. If we say we want to keep the sugars less than uh, 90 and maybe less than 130, if you go to 80, 70 or 60, the benefits will not be there. So if your LH is less than 0.2, less than two or less than four, if it is less than 0.1, it won't make any other difference at all. So this is what you need to understand. It's not the numbers that you're treating. It is the actual clinical child whom you're treating. Now, adherence is very important. If suppose you say you have to give it every 12 weeks, if they miss it, what will be the problem, Naveen? There will be uh, bleeding. So every time, so what happens if you have suppressed, it is zero. But if you leave it, it is started to increase and then you give another flare. So the timing is very important. When you say 12 weeks, it means 12 weeks. If you delay it, plus minus three, five days may be there, but if you delay it, second flare will come. Every time flare will keep on coming and that will cause a lot of problem which will happen in that perspective. Now, pubarchy, of course, as discussed, will have no effect at all in that situation. If you want to mainly focus on the uterus and in what condition you're not talking about the bones, you're talking about the uterus. 
you're not concerned about the height of the child, but you're mainly concerned about that, okay, I don't want thus the vaginal bleeding, I'm happy with whatever height is there. Which child will be that? Naveen? So somebody who is developmentally delayed in which, uh, because if they become bigger, you will have more problem in handling them. You say, okay, the main reason you're using the NIH analog, it is expensive, it has to be given so many times, is to get good height. But if you're mainly concerned about periods, you can use medroxyprogesterone acetate, which is a thing which can be given as an injection or a oral tablet, but it is bad for the bone. Progesterone leaches out bone. If you remember, progesterone is just the opposite of estrogen. Estrogen causes breast development, progesterone matures it. Estrogen causes uterine development, progesterone sheds it. Estrogen causes bone mass, this decreases bone mass. So this is another issue which you have to be worried about that. But this is the case in which you will think of MPA in that perspective. Now, GNRH basically is a decapeptide. It has got 10 peptides and there are different regions which are make it very sensitive to peptidase. So it will be gone in a minute or so in the circulation at all, especially these three and four tryptophan and serine which are there. And this six, seven position is the stability which is there. So there are modifications which have been developed. This includes the one which we use very commonly as luprolite, which has got, instead of glycine, D-leucine, which makes it more stable. We have got D-tryptorelin, and this can be given as a four weekly 3.75 and 12 weekly 12.15. The dose and all Pratik will also discuss about. Generally, people say that weight is more than 30 kgs, you can need to give more higher doses. Now, tryptorelin is a modified form. Again, glycine becomes D tryptophan, and that's why it's tryptorelin. And this is four weekly, more potent, no need to increase with weight because it has got a much wider therapeutic window. Unfortunately, less available now in that situation. And then there is a histrolin, which is once a year implant, which is given, not available in India. So most of us are now handling this luprolide, which is there in that situation. Now, this is one of uh, the initial paper that I, it was in fact one of my first papers in 2002. And this was on this topic only, long acting GNRH analog therapy. And this was the first publication from India about the use of tryptorelin in 2002 in the final height terms. So what we found that there is an improvement of approximately six centimeters if you treat it at the right time, earlier onset of precocious puberty, boys, rapid advancement have a better outcome. So this was first proof in terms of improvement. And we looked at a lot of things about this bone age, delta SD, height SDS for bone age to get that thing. So this was a evidence of efficacy of this therapy. There is now a lot of confusion as to whether you want to do uh, different form of suppressions and how do they compare in terms of monthly and uh, three monthly. And ultimately people say, it doesn't make a huge difference. Both of them have a similar suppression. Maybe LH might be affected, but otherwise the clinical progression does not vary. So if you're giving 12 weekly luprolite, it is fine. There is no uh, role of giving zero, six weeks, three weeks, 12 weeks. It's not evidence-based. So you can give zero in 12 weeks directly. It doesn't make a huge difference. Second big issue is how much should we give luprolite? Some people in the US were giving higher doses Europe was giving lower doses. So people did the study and looked into the different doses from 7.5 monthly, which is a high dose, to 11.253 monthly, and then even 30 milligrams three months. It's like a huge dose in that perspective. And what they finally found that suppression, even with 11.253 monthly, was around 67% LH less than four while this was more like 95%. So LH suppression wise, of course, if you give a high dose, there will be a good response. But clinically, it does not make a huge difference. And they said that they are not be an accurate indicator of clinical response. So if you are very obsessed with numbers, you may want to give a higher dose, but probably it is not going to make a huge difference if the bone age is not progressing that much and the clinical parameters are fine from that perspective. Now, this is another study, again, similar thing finding that quarterly tryptorelin, which is a newer preparation available, also has a similar effect, which happens in that perspective. And histrolin, a once a year preparation, again, quite effective. So you can assume an increase of around one and a half centimeter per year 
of treatment one and a half to two extra in terms of final height in that is what you can look at which is pretty similar to what you get with sga with growth hormone so if you give turner growth hormone how much benefit do you get pratik per year one so one centimeter is roughly there for sga is around one and a half this will be like one and a half to two but this is less costly so this is a much more cost effective therapy in terms of height for precocious puberty in that setting now this is what i was talking about there was a study which compared the combination of antagonist and agonist to reduce flare now they did find that the lh levels did not increase if you give antagonist which is obvious but nobody followed it up which means that nobody is really concerned about that flare let the period happen if it's happening don't do multiple things because this was cause you are giving antagonist there and agonist there you don't know what is going to happen so this is a general principle in life that don't give antagonist and agonist i have seen patients with liver disease who are on florinef and spironolactone together so this is like a opposite thing happening you are giving a uh, cabergolin on one hand and you are giving a d2 antagonist on the other so these sort of things are generally to be avoided because that can cause a huge problem in that perspective now this is the last thing probably about kispeptin and how kispeptin antagonist can be used for treatment but again experimental at the moment which is there what about peripheral precocious puberty just a few words essentially the options are to block estrogen production using aromatase inhibitor to block estrogen action using serms and e2 receptor you can block of course it's hypothyroidism you give thyroxine and they will improve